And thank you everyone for being here for this week's Wednesday webinar. I'm Shannon Dill. I'm with University of Maryland Extension. We offer these the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. And we have quite a variety of topics. So we're really excited to open up today with um, Alan Leslie. He's going to be giving us some information on um, insects. He's our, en our resident entomologist here in, uh, within Extension and my go-to for that. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors of the program, as well as all the collaborators. We have a number of private industry and university collaborators. So thank you, everyone. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Alan. All right, thank you, Shannon. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get this presentation started. So hopefully you're seeing my slides right now. Looks good. Excellent. Well, welcome, everyone. And thank you for having me here today. Um, this presentation, I'm just going to give kind of a broad overview of uh, pesticides and specifically uh, I'll be using insecticides as the main focus, uh, just because as an entomologist, um, that's just what I'm most familiar with. So as an overview of what today's presentation is going to cover, um, I'm going to start actually with a kind of historical perspective of the different chemicals that are available and the different regulations at mainly at the federal level that have governed uh, how pesticides are brought to market and, and regulated. I'll then go into a few different case studies that kind of highlight some of the modern trends uh, in insecticide technology and regulation, and how, how insecticides are being used currently um, for better or worse. And then a, a couple of slides just on the basics of making insecticide applications, for especially if there's any uh, new or beginning farmers on the call today, uh, this is going to be kind of the, the, the basic info to, to help you getting started. So to start off with, it's always good to have a kind of definition of what we're talking about. So we're going to start with a definition of, of what are pesticides. So the kind of legal definition is any material that is applied to plants, the soil, water, harvested crops, structures, clothing, or, and furnishings or animals to kill, attract, repel, or regulate, or interrupt the growth and mating of pests or to regulate plant growth, which is a giant mouthful, but essentially any kinds of chemicals that you're applying uh, anywhere to, to manage pests. That's a very broad definition. It covers a lot of different chemicals that you might not think of as pesticides. Now in agriculture, there's a subset of these chemicals uh, that we deal with more than others. These tend to be insecticides, which control insect pests, and sometimes we group mites in there too. Herbicides, of course, that control our weed pests, and fungicides that control plant diseases. But there's a whole host of other things that are also classified as different kinds of pesticides, uh, depending on your, your target pests that you're trying to manage. And some of these may be used in agriculture to some degree, but a lot of these are more specialized for other areas. <clears throat> so why would farmers want to use insecticides? So first of all, the cropping systems uh, tend to attract insect pests. So most cropping systems are very simplified environments, highly disturbed environments, and the natural enemies, the good bugs that tend to keep pest insects under control, tend to not survive in these habitats. So they tend to need a more diversified, more stable habitat. And the bugs that eat our crops tend to be better at colonizing these habitats and outbreaking before beneficial insects get there. So the good bugs just can't keep up with the growth of the bad bugs. Another reason is the, the really high uh, standards for uh, fruit quality for a lot of um, vegetable and fruit crops. So pictured here is a, a tomato. Those cloudy areas there, that's damage from stink bug feeding. Now this tomato is perfectly good to eat. You're not really going to notice it at all. If you pop that sucker in your mouth, it's going to taste just fine. But cosmetic damage uh, is something that uh, consumers are not going to be very tolerant of. So there's very low levels of, of uh, tolerance for insect damage. And also some of these can, can reduce the shelf life of uh, harvested products. 
Uh, they can make harvested products more likely to spoil uh, over time. Uh, and so it's good to, to limit this kind of damage. Also, the crops that we grow are just not naturally well defended against insects. So what, what's pictured here uh, is a wild brassica plant. So it's the wild relative of many of the cultivated crops that we grow like cabbage and broccoli and cauliflower. The plant on the right, you know, it's a tough leaf. Uh, it uh, doesn't taste very good, it's pretty bitter. Uh, it's not very palatable, not very delicious for us to eat. The same is true for insects. So those same traits that make it not very appealing for us to eat also keep it well defended against insect pests. Now we've bred them, our crops like this cabbage here, uh, to have tender soft leaves that are sweet and low in bitter compounds makes it more palatable to us, but also makes it much more palatable to insects. So the crop plants that we grow tend to be just better hosts for insects, promotes their growth and helps them to outbreak uh, in cropping systems. And another reason uh, that, that insecticides are a valuable component in agriculture is uh, invasive insects. So what this graph is showing here on the left is in the dotted line here, that's uh, skyrocketing towards the top of the graph is the value of imports. This dark solid squiggly line is the number of all insect pests that have been imported and introduced to the United States. And we can see that it's roughly tied to international commerce. We're moving more and more things around the globe and that's not gonna stop anytime soon. Insects tend to be very good hitchhikers uh, and very good at colonizing new environments. And a lot of times when they do that, um, they end up as, as pests that are not well controlled by the, the natural beneficial insects. So this little guy here on the right, this brown marmorated stink bug is a good case example of that. Um, they were introduced in the early 2000s. They caused a, caused a lot of damage, especially to fruiting crops. And a lot of insecticides are, became a crucial way to, to manage this pest and maintain crop profitability. Now insects or insecticides um, you know, are not the only way to control insect pests. And of course, they're a valuable component of integrated pest management, which is a multifaceted approach to reducing pest damage. Uh, insecticides are a tool that should be used in concert with cultural, mechanical, prevention, sanitation, other control methods to uh, manage insect pests in a kind of holistic way. And the whole idea and the premise of integrated pest management could in effect be its own presentation on its own. So we're really just introducing the topic here, but it's important to understand that insecticides and other pesticides are valuable tools, but they're not going to be the only way to manage your different pests in agricultural systems. So as I mentioned, we're gonna start um, the presentation here with a little overview of pesticide history. And this is gonna focus on both the major technological innovations through time and also uh, how they were regulated in different ways. So for the major chemistry innovations, we're gonna talk about them in terms of their safety for humans. And we do that using what are called LD50 values. So briefly, an LD50 value describes the lethal dose that on average would kill or be toxic to 50% uh, of the individuals in a population. So the idea is that any given population like this make-believe population of caterpillars here, are gonna have some variability in how sensitive they are to different pesticides. So. Uh, one dose might kill some, but not others. The LD50 value is on average, if you applied that chemical to a population and you do this over varying concentrations, it's the concentration that would on average kill 50% of those individuals and leave the other 50% alive. But in terms of human health, we talk about this in terms of uh, toxicity to lab rats. So lab rats tend, tend to be the model organism to describe how toxic different chemicals are uh, to mammals in general and, and um, by association to humans, because you know, it's not, not good lab practice to actually test pesticides directly on humans. So we use lab, lab rats instead. So I'll also go over the major regulatory changes and how they impact 
which chemicals are, are used. Uh, talk a little bit about trends in agricultural production practice through time and how that impacted uh, pesticide selection, specifically insecticide selection by different farmers. And overall, hopefully you'll see that uh, over the decades, there, there's trends uh, over the last hundred years or so towards safer and more effective chemicals being applied in agricultural system and an overall increase in the regulatory oversight of insecticides. So this graph here is a summary that was uh, compiled by uh, USDA, which shows generally different the use of different pesticide classes in agriculture since the 1960s. We see here that the biggest component of this is this dark green, these are herbicides. We see that herbicide use really exploded from the 60s into the 80s, and now makes up the majority uh, you know, by volume of pesticides that are applied in agricultural systems. Insecticides were, the number one component starting in the 60s, and we see that it actually dwindles through time. So there's fluctuations across the decades, but the volume of insecticides that are applied to agricultural systems now are much smaller than they were back in the 60s. And we're gonna talk about how technology and use has, has changed that. So we're gonna start before the 60s though. So pre-World War II, because World War II and the, um, the innovations that were driven by the war effort really changed the uh, availability of different chemistries that could be applied as pesticides. But pre-World War II, things were a lot simpler. So most of the chemicals that were being applied as pesticides were inorganic uh, chemistries. So things like sulfur, arsenic ox oxides, mercury, lead. Uh, there's a, one that was very popular called Paris green, which is a uh, salt of copper. Um, and these things were very, very effective at killing insects. The problem was they were not very selective. So they're very, very effective at killing people too. So as an example of this, Paris Green, this picture on the right here, had an LD50 value of 22 milligrams per kilograms uh, in rats. So with LD50s, the lower the number here, effectively, the more toxic the chemical is because it takes less of that chemical to kill 50% of your population. So there were some, also some naturally occurring uh, organic compounds that were extracted from plants that were used as insecticides. So things like nicotine extracted from tobacco, uh, natural pyrethrums uh, from chrysanthemum plants, rotenone, which is uh, extracted from jicama, and cyanides, which are naturally produced in different fruit pits, were all uh, extracted and used as insecticides as well. And these two, some of these early kind of botanical insecticides also tended to be relatively toxic. So black leaf here, which is nicotine sulfate, which is isolated from tobacco plants, had an LD50 value of only 50 milligrams per kilogram. So kind of on par with uh, some of these other inorganic chemistries. They worked really, really well on insects but they're also very, very toxic to humans. Now, <clears throat> the oversight of pesticide sale in the US was controlled by what was called the Insecticide Act of 1910. And essentially this regulation uh, kind of protected people against snake oil salesmen. So it's um, <clears throat> emphasis was on um, labeling and set standards for purity, uh, but they weren't as concerned with, with human safety. <laughs> As I mentioned, post-World War II, uh, a big part of the war effort uh, drove a lot of innovation, especially in uh, science and, and the science of chemistry. So organic chemistry especially took off during this period, and there were a lot of new chemicals that were offshoots of some that were developed for different parts of the war effort. So <clears throat> a couple of the early synthetic organic insecticides um, that were produced were organochlorines, such as dichloro, diphenyl, trichloroethane, which we know affectionately as DDT. Uh, so on the right here, DDT had an LD50 value of about 250 milligrams per kilogram. So this is an order of magnitude less toxic to humans than some of those uh, early insecticides that were, were used. 
And we also see uh, the carbamates are developed. And one of the earliest ones was a chemical called carbaryl. Carbaryl is still used today. It's the active ingredient in the insecticide seven, which is probably one of the most widely used insecticides in um, especially in home gardens and, and ornamental uh, horticulture. And it's also used in agriculture as well. It's still used, um, it's still very effective against certain pests like Japanese beetles. During this period, we see a dramatic increase in the insecticide use in field crops. Uh, during this period, synthetic nitrogen fertilizers also come to the market for the first time. So we're upping the yields of crops, the values of these crops increased. And so there's a bigger demand to protect them from insect feeding and yield loss from, from insect pests. So we start seeing some of these uh, more effective and, and slightly safer insecticides being used across wider areas. During this period, the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide and Rodenticide Act is passed, which is known as FIFRA. And FIFRA just set the guidelines, set the foundation for the federal government to regulate the sale and use of pesticides broadly. Early on, it was not as uh, powerful as it is now. There, uh, there's subsequent amendments to it that give it more power. And early on, it just focused on labeling the contents of these different pesticides. And also during this period, this was a very busy time for, uh, for pesticides. Uh, uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson really <clears throat> sparked public policy debate over the overall safety of insecticides and other pesticides and their, as their use increased across larger uh, acreages. Through the 60s and the 70s, uh, pesticide use continues to expand. So there's still a wide use of insecticides across large acreages of field crops. Those early organochlorine insecticides like DDT begin to be phased out in favor of a, a new class called the organophosphates. So an example of an organophosphate chemical that's still used today, malathion, LD50 values of between 900 to 5,800 uh, milligrams per kilograms in rats. So you see here another order of magnitude or two uh, less lethal than the organochlorines. So um, <clears throat> much safer for, for humans to be handling and applying these. And so that spurred their, their adoption in agriculture. A lot of these were a byproduct of chemical warfare. So they're in the same kind of class of chemicals as sarin gas. So they are nerve toxins. They act on the nervous system of insects. They also have activity on the nervous system in humans. But as we see from the LD50 values, it takes a lot of these chemicals uh, in a single dose to kill a human. So in general, they're a lot safer than some of the earlier chemicals. The FIFRA amendments are now added that allow the federal government to cancel product registrations. So it gave the federal government the power to essentially ban insecticides and other pesticides from being used. Uh, and the EPA was established in 1970 to administer FIFRA and to take over uh, regulating uh, insecticides and other pesticides. The, in 72, the Federal Environmental Pesticide Control Act was passed, which further strengthened FIFRA. It set new health and safety requirements for new pesticides being brought to market and set requirements for uh, risk assessments. So assessments of the risk and benefits of these products. So if you're going to bring something to market that's highly toxic to humans, it had better be highly effective against a very important pest. Um, in other words, if it's going to be risky, it, it had better have uh, big benefits to, to balance it out. Through the 70s and 80s, pesticide use overall continues to grow. The use of insecticides um, <clears throat> somewhat declines during this period. The federal government kind of flexed its muscles with the FIFRA amendments and canceled registrations for many of those organochlorines, the earliest, some of the earliest uh, insecticides that were brought to market, um, mainly because they persisted in the environment. So it found that they're not breaking down, they tend to build up over time and cause um, environmental problems uh, after repeated application. During this time period, a new class of insecticides called the synthetic pyrethroids are introduced. So the natural pyrethrum, um, 
was very effective. It's another nerve toxin that, that's active against insects. They're very effective at quickly killing insects, but they were not very UV stable. So the early ones would break down under direct sunlight, but these new synthetic pyrethroids had a lot uh, longer residual activity because they were more UV stable. So it would reduce the total number of insecticide applications if you got two to three weeks of activity out of some of these different formulations. So you see here the LD50 values of these, you know, on par with some of the or organophosphates. So they're all relatively safe for humans, especially compared to those earlier insecticides that were released. Uh, in this period, you know, it's during the, the, the oil crisis. So petroleum prices increase. Uh, the cost of just driving the tractor across the field increases. So if you've got now these chemicals that can give you multiple weeks of control, reduce the number of times you have to apply them and potentially save farmers money on uh, driving the tractors, uh, that spurred their adoption uh, by different farmers. Through the 80s, um, pesticide use overall stabilizes and we see a kind of continued decline in the volume of insecticides that are being applied. Uh, part of, well, commodity prices during this period decrease and on-farm income decreases. So part of it is farmers are no longer able to afford additional insecticide sprays. So they're reducing the number of sprays as a cost-saving measure. Um, CRP programs during this period are initiated. So these are federal programs that take marginal cropland out of production and pay farmers to convert it to natural wildlife habitat. And so <clears throat> some acreage is taken out of production and that also decreased the total volume of pesticides because they're no longer spraying insecticides over those areas. And during this period, those synthetic pyrethroids, which were introduced in the previous generation or the previous decade, begin to gradually replace a lot of the organophosphates as the main insecticides being used across large areas of agriculture. Uh, they have better efficacy and they tend to be applied at much lower rates. So that too can account for the reduction in the total volume of insecticide. So your typical application rate for an organophosphate like malathion might be one to one and a half pints per acre. But for one of the synthetic pyrethroids like permethrin, you may only be applying it at two to eight ounces per acre. So this alone can account for a great reduction in the total volume of insecticides being applied to the land. Just better, better efficacy of these new chemicals. During the 90s, overall pesticide use remains relatively stable and insecticide use um, also tends to stabilize in this period. The use of synthetic pyrethroids continues to increase uh, they're, they're more widely adopted. There's more improvements on existing chemistries. So the number of different types of pyrethroids available increases. And in another new class of insecticides, the neonicotinoids are introduced. So these are also insect nerve toxins, uh, but they act on an area of the insect nervous system that humans just don't have an analog for. So they're essentially non-toxic to humans because we just don't have the, the, the cellular receptors that these chemicals act on. If you look over here, the LD50 value of this example, uh, neonicotinoid and Meyer, which is a metacloprid, is between 500 to 825 milligrams per kilogram. You see that this is, <clears throat> it, it does have a lower LD50 value than some of the other chemicals that we mentioned before. But that's because this is the LD50 for the entire formulation. So it doesn't just include the active ingredient, but all of the other uh, chemicals that have to be added to it to, to keep it in suspension and to keep it stable and allow you to apply it. The imidacloprid itself is essentially non-toxic, but the entire formulation may be more toxic than the imidacloprid alone. But these chemicals are unique because they're systemic within plants. So if you apply, apply these pesticides, most pesticides you need to cover the entire plant to make sure that you actually hit the, the insect pest with that chemical so that the insect can be exposed to it and be killed. With these neonicotinoids, the plants will take it up directly from their leaves. They can take it up from their roots. Uh, they can take it up from the trunk if you're applying it to a tree. 
and then they store it inside of their cells, inside of the tissue of the plant. So as, the plant, as more insects feed on that plant, they can get exposed to it that way. So you get longer efficacy of these insecticides because they're not sitting on the surface of the plant. They're not exposed to UV radiation. They're not gonna get washed off. Uh, and you're not relying on total plant coverage. So that really changes the way you can actually apply these insecticides. If you don't have to apply it to the entire plant, we start seeing them uh, being applied to soil drenches and seed treatments, which um, reduce the chance for, for spray drift and, and other uh, non-target effects. So during the 90s, we also have the Food Quality Protection Act passed. And this set the current standards for um, safety of pesticide residues in food. So now during this period, uh, this expansion of FIFRA, they begin to account for not just individual pesticides that are applied to crops, but the total number of pesticides that are applied to crops and how those combinations of residues might adversely impact different groups. So kind of current day, 2000s to present, we see you know, some slight declines in pesticide use through time. Um, during this period, we see the number of insecticides specifically decrease from, from about the 2000s uh, to the present day. A large part of that is due to the adoption of two groups. First are the transgenic BT crops. So BT corn, mainly and BT cotton down south. These are crops that are genetically modified to express proteins that are insecticidal. So uh, there are some that specifically target caterpillar pests. There are some that specifically target uh, beetle pests, but they're all completely non-toxic to humans. So they're completely safe for us to eat, again, because we don't have the, uh, the target uh, molecular receptors in our, um, in this case, in our digestive system that these toxic proteins attack. So we digest them just fine, but if a caterpillar like this corn earworm feeds on it, uh, it would shrivel up and die. But they're already enclosed in the plants. You know, the plants are producing it on their own. So that reduces the number of sprays that, that farmers have to make to protect these crops against other insects. And the other <clears throat> major innovation during this time period is the adoption of neonicotinoids as seed treatments. So remember, since these insecticides are taken up systemically by the plant, you don't have to get total coverage of it. In this case, you can apply it to the seed as a seed coating. You see these different colored seeds here are all coated with different seed treatments. Um, as soon as that plant germinates, it begins to take up that insecticide and it's stored in that small developing plant when it's at its most vulnerable stages, it's already protected from any feeding by insect pests. This graph here is showing from, you know, the early 2000s on this kind of explosion in the application of neonicotinoids as seed treatment, especially here in, uh, in red in corn and in orange here in soybeans. And this replaced a lot of later applications uh, that would have come, you know, over the top from tractors and it's being applied at much lower rates than you would have to apply if you were spraying it over the top of plants. So this graph here is from 2006, but it, it kind of represents the uh, breakdown of the different chemical classes that are commonly used in agriculture today. So we see that the majority of, um, of pesticides, or majority of insecticides that are used in agriculture fall into one of four groups that we've talked about already. The organophosphates in blue, the carbamates in yellow, then the pyrethroids in orange, and the neonicotinoids in gray. Now we've talked about how great the neonicotinoids are because they're systemic, they're long lasting. The pyrethroids, you know, apply them at very low rates and they're relatively safe from a human health standard. So why would we still be using so many of these other compounds as well, the organophosphates and the carbamates, which do have human health concerns? Uh, why are they still used in such large proportions in modern agriculture when we have these other chemicals available? So the reason for that, the main reason for that is to mitigate insecticide resistance. So as an example, as we talked about before, any given population of a pest 
some individuals are going to be more tolerant of different groups of insecticides than others. So if you make a pesticide application to this uh, hypothetical group of moths here that are, are crop pests, we see that the ones highlighted in red just happen to be naturally resistant to that chemistry. So in the following generation, if all the rest of the susceptible ones are wiped out and only the resistant ones are left, the next generation is going to have a higher proportion of individuals that are resistant to that type of pesticide if there's a genetic component, if they can pass down that resistance to their offspring. So if we're constantly using the same chemistry generation after generation, we're constantly selecting for those individuals that have those resistant traits. So over time, resistant individuals tend to build up in proportion in those populations to the point where that particular chemistry is no longer effective on that pest population. So to combat this, the main resource for combating this is to rotate between different modes of action. Modes of action generally describe the mechanism that allows a pesticide uh, to kill its target pest. Um, so as an example of that, <clears throat> on the screen now are seven different pesticides, Mustang Max, Bifenthrin, Permethrin, uh, Deltamethrin, Bathrin, all these different pesticides or insecticides. Uh, they, they're all different products, but they all have the exact same mode of action. They're all synthetic pyrethroids and all pyrethroids, even though they're different chemicals inside of the insect, they all work the same way to kill that insect pest. So if an insect becomes resistant to one of these pyrethroids like bifenthrin, chances are it's also going to have cross resistance to some of these other pyrethroid insecticides. So uh, when you're rotating between different pesticides to mitigate resistance, it's important to rotate between different modes of actions. So this is the reason why, although there's a lot of benefits to using synthetic pyrethroids and um, uh, <clears throat> the neonicotinoids, it's also useful to rotate some of those old chemistries like uh, the organophosphates and the carbamates. So next, I'd like to briefly cover some of the current trends in insecticide use and insecticide technology, um, and some of the things we're seeing broadly with, with um, insecticide use. And one is kind of a, a recent pro problem uh, that's crept up, and that is the use of, of insecticides prophylactically. So we've already mentioned that nearly 100% of corn seed uh, well, we've already mentioned that a whole lot of uh, field crop seeds come pre-treated with uh, neonicotinoid seed treatments. So the insecticide is already applied to the seed. So nearly 100% of corn seed is treated this way. It's actually very difficult to find field corn seed that does not already come from the manufacturer with a seed treatment on it. Uh, part of the three, uh, the other prophylactic treatment is with some of these generic formulations. So a lot of the um, synthetic pyrethroids, which were introduced uh, back in the 80s and, and, uh, and 70s, uh, they're now off patent. So there's a lot of generics available that are, were much cheaper than when they were still um, manufactured under a patent. So the, at the very, very low application rates that these chemicals have, you know, we're talking a couple of ounces per acre, it could be as cheap as $2 an acre to apply some of these generic formulations uh, across your field. With fuel prices the way they are, um, it's not economical to be making multiple trips across the field to apply insecticides if pest populations or pest problems show up later on. So what a lot of farmers are tend to be doing now is to apply them at the same time they're making other passes across the field. So for instance, you might have a cover crop that's planted ahead of your corn or soybeans. And so mixing a little bit of uh, pyrethroid in with the herbicide that you use to burn down the cover crop. There's, uh, we mentioned the seed treatments that go down with most field crops at planting, but there's also 
synthetic pyrethroids that can go down as a soil drench. And some people are applying these on top of the seed treatment. And remember, this is in addition to the protection that the transgenic BT corn already has against insect pests. For post-emergence herbicide applications after the crop gets up, there's a lot of farmers who are tank mixing um, some of these pyrethroids in the mix just to, just to kill any bad bugs that might be out there. And then any fungicide applications that might put on um, you know, at tasseling and pollination, mixing another pyrethroid in there a lot of times just makes economic sense. However, the downside is these applications are really not being made based on any integrated pest management approach. So <clears throat> it's unclear if there's any pests out there that are actually being controlled by these applications, either as seat treatments or as tank mix sprays. And it's likely that these applications are having impacts on natural enemies and beneficial insects and may actually be causing more pest problems than they are preventing. So <clears throat> it's important to make these applications after doing scouting and identifying that there is a pest out there that will be controlled by the spray. And these prophylactic sprays, these, these convenient take mixes are likely down the road gonna cause more problems with resistance development uh, than they're potentially solving. <clears throat> Another trend that we see in, in modern insecticide technology is a trend towards uh, companies releasing more um, selective chemistries and especially uh, chemicals that have greatly reduced uh, health risks for humans. Uh, so an, a good example of that <clears throat> is a relatively new class of insecticides. It's only been released probably in the last 10 years or so, the diamides. They're highly selective against caterpillars and some other um, insect pests like uh, fly larvae. They work on uh, insects that, that go through complete metamorphosis. So um, things like caterpillars that turn into butterflies and, and uh, fly um, larvae that, that, that underget, undergo pupation and turn into the adult flies. Uh, they tend to be much softer on natural enemies. So your beneficial insects are not impacted by these chemistries. Uh, pollinators are not impacted by these chemistries. Um, so they're, they're safer to apply and to maintain some of those beneficial insects. The diamides have very low mammalian toxicity. So up on par with the neonicotinoids and being essentially non-toxic to, to humans and other mammals. Um, they're an expensive chemistry because they're still produced under patent. But again, they're very useful in rotation with other modes of action to limit the development of insecticide resistance. Um, and there are incentives essentially through EPA for getting more of these reduced risk chemicals uh, to market. So EPA has greatly reduced the number of toxicity tests that companies have to do uh, in order to, to get a product registered and bring it to market if they can show early on that it has this very low mammalian toxicity, if they are truly a reduced risk chemical. And that's to promote more of these um, relatively safe insecticides. Another one of the trends that we see, uh, especially from insecticide companies, is a proliferation of these premixes. So a lot of the quote unquote new pesticides or new insecticides that are being brought to market are essentially just premixes of existing chemistries. And what a lot of companies are doing is taking uh, one of their one of their products that's on patent still, the patent's about to expire, they'll tank mix it with another insecticide and then patent that mix. <laughs> so that kind of extends the useful life of that uh, the patent on that that new chemistry. So um, some examples of that. So the Siege, Indigo, Z, C, and Elevest are three insecticides over the past five or six years that are, that are new to market. But in reality, they're just uh, mixes, in this case of um, different insecticides that were about to lose their, uh, their patent. 
mixed with um, these synthetic pyrethroids. So now this, this tank mix gets its own separate patent and now they can continue to sell this without it, it um, being swamped out by generics. Uh, as far as pesticide, insecticide trends for organic insecticides, you know, organic insecticides, they have to be derived from a natural source. They can't be manufactured in the lab. So that greatly limits the diversity of chemistries that can be applied in organic cropping systems. So within organic insecticides, there's really only a handful of different chemicals that, that, that give any real control of insect pests. And unfortunately, the conventional insecticides, uh, the companies producing these conventional insecticides have picked up on that and they take these chemistries and they modify them. They make better insecticides that are based off of these organic insecticides uh, and they sell them broadly. Um, and we, we start to see problems with resistance development because they're, they're being used over wide areas. So as an example of that, you know, pyrethrum, natural pyrethrums extracted from chrysanthemum plants are very effective organic insecticides. They give good knockdown control of a wide array of insect pests, <clears throat> but they have the same mode of action. They work in the same exact way as our synthetic pyrethroids. And we already talked about how the synthetic pyrethroids you know, are, are much more effective because they're UV stable and they last longer in the environment. There's widespread adoption of these across all sectors of farming. And so these are being applied over large areas and there's a lot of resistance development in different species of insects. Well, these insects are now also cross resistant to the organic pyrethrum. And although on the synthetic side of things in conventional agriculture, we can come up with new pyrethroids that might have some better efficacy. The organic side is stuck with what can be naturally extracted from, um, from natural sources. Another example of that is, is BT. So uh, BT is essentially um, spores derived from the species, the, the soil bacterium, Bacillus thuringiensis. You can get it as <clears throat> uh, powder, powdered, preserve spores that you mix in suspension. They're very effective against uh, caterpillar pests. You can also get some that are effective against um, beetles and some that are effective against flies. These are all different formulations that are, are approved by OMRI and, and approved for use in organic systems. But it's the same exact mode of action, especially the caterpillar um, mode of action, the, the ones that are active against caterpillars, the same mode of action as BT crops. So since there's been such widespread adoption of, of BT crops for corn and cotton, any of the insects that are feeding on these crops that have developed resistance like corn earworm are now going to be cross resistant to the organic BT varieties that are available. And one final example of that is spinosad. So spinosad is another um, bacterial insecticide. It's very, very effective against caterpillars. Um, and, and, and some fly pests in organic agriculture. And this one in particular, some specialty crops rely heavily on this for some key pests, but there's synthetic spinosins that are, um, again, modified versions of the natural spinosad that uh, are widely applied and have the same mode of action. And so any of the uh, insects that have developed resistance to spinosins now are also resistant to those organic spinosids. <clears throat> so now we're getting close to the end of the presentation. I um, want to cover a couple of slides on how to go about making your own insecticide application. So first is choosing insecticides. So there's a few steps that are involved in deciding which insecticides you should be applying. And the first step is to correctly identify the pest. So there's a lot of resources that Extension has to help you to identify uh, pests that you might be seeing uh, in your crops. So those <clears throat> include crop updates that will give scouting reports, detailing what pests are showing up in which areas and what you should be looking for at any given time of the year in different crops, and also different guides for uh, correctly identifying different insects once you find them in the field. Next, identify the crop. So um, 
you know, all in insecticides can't be used on all crops. They have to be labeled for a specific pest on a specific crop. So even within individual crops, some stages of that crop are going to be more or less sensitive to insect feeding damage. So as an example, this, these soybean pods here are just covered in these green stink bug nymphs. But this soybean plant is at one of the late growth stages. So these stink bugs can feed and feed as much as they want, but they're not gonna reduce the yield of this plant one bit because the, the seeds are already made at this point. So it's not worth making any insecticide application. Next would be to determine thresholds. So depending on the crop and the pest that you're looking at, in some cases, there's mathematical models that predict how many of that pest or what feeding uh, level will actually cause economic damage and at what point should you actually um, make an insecticide application to try to actively control that pest. So most crops can withstand a certain amount of feeding damage without significant impact on yield. But these thresholds can help to decide uh, when it makes economic sense to actually fire up the uh, sprayer and try to, um, try to eliminate that pest. And then selecting the actual chemistry. So uh, the, for any given crop, for any given pest, there's going to be a whole range of different um, insecticides that are labeled some are going to be more effective than others, and every uh, chemical company is going to tell you that theirs is the best. So Extension has many different guides uh, that are basically compilations of spray trials that will give you relative efficacy values of different uh, pesticides. And these are going to be independent trials um, that are going to give you a non-biased recommendation. So anyone considering using insecticides at any capacity should consider becoming certified as a private pesticide applicator. So pesticides are generally categorized as general or restricted use pesticides. Restricted use pesticides tend to have specific risks associated with using them such that their use is limited to, to people who have specific training, so certified applicators. But the safety um, that, that you would learn, the, the safety skills that you would learn from completing the certification process, you know, translate to the general use pesticides as well. It's something that everybody sh should probably do if they're going to use pesticides in any capacity. Also, I know uh, this, the, reach, the target reach of this, this webinar is across the mid-Atlantic, but if you happen to be in Maryland, uh, Maryland specifically has additional restrictions on certain uh, very widely used pesticides. So some general use pesticides like the uh, neonicotinoids, you have to be a certified pesticide applicator to use them, even though they're not registered as restricted use chemicals uh, across the, the U.S. So to become certified, you have to take and pass the core exam. So every state has their own pesticide applicator core manual. Most of them should be available online for free as PDFs, or you can purchase them through your extension office. Uh, for Maryland, at least, there's a, a small $7 fee you've got to pay, and then you renew every three years. And the whole, the whole process tends to be administered by states' departments of agriculture. Um, and again, the pest, these pesticide applications are going to be limited to your farm. So technically, you can, uh, if you have a private applicator cert certification, you're only licensed to make applications on your own land or land that you're renting and in control of. You can't legally have someone come and make applications on your own property unless they are a commercial applicator. So you've gone through your certification, you've um, used all the guides to figure out what you should spray for your target pest. And now you're, you've got your sprayer all ready to go. You've got your chemicals. There's a few other things you probably need to know before you actually load things up and, and pull the trigger, like the application rate. What specific restrictions do you have? Any adjuvants or any other chemicals you need to add to the mix to make the pesticides work better? What types of sprayers should you be using? What nozzles should you be using? What pressure should you be using? What per personal protective equipment should you be wearing? 
How do you safely store and dispose of these chemicals when you're not applying them? And are there any harvest and reentry limitations? Well, all of this information and more is located on the pesticide label. So for any given pesticide, the label is actually a small booklet containing all of the safety information that you would ever need to know to make a safe application uh, of that particular chemical. All of this is a part of the, the registration of the product that's administered through EPA. And essentially all of these rules and regulations on the label uh, are effectively the law governing the use of that particular chemistry. So two resources you should be aware of to help you to navigate these labels. One is this website, cdms.net. This is a website that has an archive of basically all of the insecticides that are, or all of the pesticides in general that are used in agriculture, along with PDF examples of their labels. So if you ever need to look up any information about any pesticides, you can find it there. And also ask your extension agent. So many of these pesticide labels have that <clears throat> as a specific instruction if you've got any questions about any component of making an application. It'll, it'll say explicitly to contact your extension agent um, to, to help with that application. So please feel free to identify and reach out to, to your local extension agent when making these applications. So in summary, pesticides have made uh, played a major role in increasing US agricultural production over the years. The trends in insecticide use are really driven by innovation market prices, and also uh, human and environmental health concerns and how those have all evolved over the decades. In general, the current trends in insecticide technology really introduced more, more effective, less toxic chemicals that are less harmful to the environment. And there's a lot of incentives by EPA to bring more of these types of products to market. And there's, there tends to be a bigger demand for these types of products from uh, consumers. And judicious use of insecticides really requires detailed knowledge of your cropping system, including the crop cycle and the pest biology, and really careful monitoring of pest populations within a season and, and over time so you can predict when, when things will happen. And with that, um, if I have any little bit of time or, or anybody has any questions, I, I'd be willing to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Alan. That was a, a great overview. Um, you guys are welcome to enter it. any questions you might have into the chat pod or feel free to unmute. I'm gonna stop recording at this point.